Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Davide Boerio, postdoctoral researcher at UCC and the Euronews uh, project. I'm going to be the, the chair of this panel, uh, Early Modern News. Let me just me say, uh, share with you my excitement to chairing a panel directly from my living room. But you know, nowadays, you know, the digital is real, but we don't know if this reality is uh, rational but let's hope for the best. So I just want to introduce our first speaker who is uh, uh, Dr. Flor Giovanni Florio from University of Padova. He's going to talk about that uh, with a, a paper titled uh, the Demonologist in the World Writings, Strozzi Cicogna and the Venetian Interdict. Giovanni Florio is a postdoctoral researcher within the risk of republics on the stage of King Project, supported by the European Research Council based at the University of Padova. A risk a project investigates the representation of Republican state power in Europe of absolute monarchy, 16th and uh, early 18th century. Uh, within this project, Giovanni Florio is investigating the performative aspects of the political communication between Venice and its subject territories. So please on stage, Giovanni Florio, the, po uh, the podium is yours. Thank you, Davide, uh, I'm glad to see you again. Yeah. And uh, thank, uh, thanks to all the scientific committee of this uh, very interesting and exciting conference. Time is ticking, so please allow me to immediately pass and move to my presentation. Just a moment, I will share my PowerPoint, can you see it? Yes. Okay, thanks. Okay. So, <clears throat> at the beginning of the 17th century, the tension between Rome and the Republic of Venice reached its apex. On the 17th of April, 1606, Pope, Pope, Pope Paul V sanctioned the anti-ecclesiastical agenda of the Venetian government by excommunicating the Doge and the Senate and by proclaiming the interdict, that is to say the suspension of the holy sacraments in all the Venetian subject territories. The Pope publicly announced his decision through the publication of a breve di censura et interdetto, also known as monitorio. As stated by Paolo Sarpi, who was the legal consultant and maitre pensée of the Venetian government, the spiritual sanctions aimed to undermine social cohesion and even urge the Venetian subjects and subject cities uh, to revolt, sollevarsi, against their rulers. More recently, Filippo de Vivo has compared the interdict with the modern international sanctions. The suspension of the sacraments armed common people in order to urge them to put pressure on the Venetian government, forcing it to revoke the anti-ecclesiastical measures it had previously approved. Sorry, I had a strange echo on, on my... Maybe someone uh, at the, at the um, mic open. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. Um, Mm. Okay. Uh, the interdict crisis was a jurisdictional conflict, but also a conflict of information and communication. The news of the sacrament suspensions need to be known and widely spread in order to provoke the social and political disturbances the Pope wished for. At the beginning of the crisis, the Venetian government tried to censor the news Rome was trying to spread through the Venetian territories in any way and through any possible media. But censorship alone was clearly not enough. Starting from August 1606, Venice chose to directly answer the information offensive launched by Rome by publishing several pamphlets defending the Venetian government and proclaiming its reasons. The conflict quickly escalated. A plethora of official, unofficial, and semi-official conflicting voices flooded the European information market with news and opinions about the Venetian crisis. 
To quote Paolo Sarpi, the interdict was a war of writings fought by both Rome and Venice and their supporters in order to gain the favor of an increasing audience, in order to <clears throat> engage it and make it act or not act as a political actor. Sarpi coined this apt expression, War of Writings, in the Historia dell'Interdetto, published uh, after his death in 1624. But we can find a very similar definition in a letter written by Strozzi Cicogna in August 1606, at the very beginning of the War of Writings. Strozzi Cicogna is historiographically known as a theologian and demonologist. But as he remembered in the frontispiece of its main work, he was also a jurist. And first of all, a gentleman hailing from Vicenza, one of the main subject cities of the Venetian Republic. During the interdict, uh, Cicogna was in Venice as Nunzio della Città di Vicenza. He was a sort of resident ambassador appointed by the City Council of Vicenza to politically and juridically represent its interests toward the Venetian government. And it was properly in this capacity that Cicogna wrote the letter I've quoted, which is a letter addressed to the deputati, the leaders, the, the head of Vicenza's uh, Civic Council, in order to inform them about what was happening between Venice and Rome and to advise them how to act accordingly. Gathering information refining, processing, and sending them to Vicenza's municipal authorities was an important part of Cicogna's duties as Nunzio. It was the perfect task for an eclectic and intellectually curious man like Cicogna was. And from this point of view, he was the right man in the right place. As being accredited to the Ducal Palace, he enjoyed both formal access to the center of the Republican decision-making process and informal access to the man who handled it. Time does not allow me to present Cicogna's broker client network, which involved the Venetian patricians, officers of the Ducal Chancery, former Venetian governors of Vicenza, and other prominent figures. Cicogna was understandably reticent in naming his sources, but it's quite clear that a considerable amount of the information, and in some cases, secret information he gathered came from this network, which was deeply inside the government apparatus. But the antechambers of the Ducal Palace were not, on, were not the only places Cicogna frequented in order to gather political information. As being resident ambassador of Vicenza, um, he lived in the Casa Vicentina, a sort of embassy of the subject city of Vicenza that was and he is here. Along the route, he daily followed between the Casa Vicentina and the Ducal Palace, there was and there is Contrada San Moise, known as the Writer's Street, because of the presence of many shops of copists, copists gazettieri, sellers of avisi, reportisti, booksellers, and other information professionals. Contrada San Moise was the right place to be during a war of words. Many letters written by Cicogna during the interdict have a paragraph explicitly focused on the cose del mondo or world news, in which he summarized information about the crisis he clearly got from foreign avisi. From his vantage point, Cicogna also followed the daily evolution of the war of writings. Attached to his letters, he sent any editorial novelty about the interdict which appeared in the Venetian book market. He sent the anti-ecclesiastical orations in praise of the Doge Leonardo Donà, as well as the official protesto published by the Venetian Senate against the Papal sanction. He sent the pamphlets of Paolo Sarpi, as well as the anti-Venetian works of Cesare Baronio and Bellarmino. At the very beginning of uh, the crisis, he even sent to Vicenza the work of Jean Gerson, anonymously re-edited by Paolo Sarpi. These booklets have been recently recognized as the first shot of the war of writings, and Strozzi Cicogna 
got them five days earlier than the ambassador of Mantua did. But Ciconia did not limit himself sending these pamphlets to Vicenza's municipal authorities. He also gave advice on how to read them. Just one example. On the 3rd of August, 1606, he presented the Parenesis at Republican Venetum by Cesare Baronio. And he presented it as, a, as an invective against the Republic, which would complicate any attempt of peace negotiation between Venice and Rome. Probably he was aware of what the Venetian Senate was debating. In the very same moment he was writing, the Senate was about to approve the publication of a first series of official pro-Venetian pamphlets. At least theoretically, this decision was supposed to be secret, as all the Senate's works. But as we can see, this information was totally accessible to Ciconia. Oh yes, a, a little aside, of course, Ciconia was a huge fan of Paolo Sarpi, who was the, the, the rising star at the moment. Uh, nevertheless, Strozzi Ciconia was uh, completely aware that the war of writings was only a part, even though relevant, of the war of communication engaged between Venice and Rome. Venice was a ceremonial city. And Strozzi Ciconia understood that the Venetian government was re-semanticizing the entire complex of its civic and religious rituals in order to use it as a communicative weapon or maybe a communicative shield against the papal claims. Performatively speaking, the Republic was using its well-rooted repertoire of rituals in order to proclaim its sovereignty and its serenity in a moment in which both were questioned by spiritual sanctions. In particular, the continuation of the sacraments and the popular involvement in the Republican celebratory system was assumed, were assumed as signs proving the ineffectiveness of the papal excommunication. We have clear proof about that, for instance, in the letters written by the English ambassador, Sir Henry Wotton. As a theologian, Ciconia as well was particularly impressed by these aspects of the Venetian political communication. In his letters, he gave passionate and detailed descriptions of processions, masses, and civic ceremonies. But as being a diplomat, he was also interested in diplomatic receptions and entries. The presence or the absence of foreign ambassadors, their behavior, towards the Doge and towards the ecclesiastical authorities were assumed by Ciconia as sources of information about the de development of the crisis. Ciconia perf perfectly understood that Baroque diplomatic form was the substance of Baroque politics and political communication. And that's why he was particularly concerned with military parades. The risk that the war of writings would transcend into a full-scale war was clearly perceived by Ciconia, who was particularly anxious about that. In his letters, he periodically reported about movements of troops, military investments, and launches of new war fleets. We must consider that he was writing, he was addressing to members of Vicenza's nobility, which was basically a military nobility serving in the Venetian army, but also in other European armies. But Ciconia was also concerned with popular reaction to this massive exhibition of politically, political, military, and diplomatic strength. Just one example. On the 11th of February, 1607, Ciconia described the impressive ceremonial apparatus which had been prepared in Piazza San Marco on the occasion of the appointment of the Capitano Generale da Mar, the supreme commander of the Venetian fleet. After the Holy Mass, Piazza San Marco was full of people. Bells, drums, trumpets, musket and cannon fires filled the air with noises. A huge amount of gold was displayed in Piazzetta San Marco between the Ducal Palace and the State Mint. And when the entourage of the Spanish ambassador passed near of gold, 
people started grumbling, saying that it was dangerous to leave so many Spanish people so close to the Venetian gold. Spain, of course, was the main ally of the Pope. But Cicogna was also a demonologist. Already in March 1606, one month before the official outbreak of the crisis, he reported about a bad omen. On Easter day, a lightning ruined the bell tower of, San, of Santa Maria dei Frari, and six people who had preferred to go have fun instead of attending the Vespers were found drowned. Something similar, another gondola's shipwreck, happened in August on the eve of San Rocco, which was an important festivity in the Venetian calendar. The sight of so many corpses along the Riva degli Schiavoni in front of the Ducal Palace was a pitiful sight, which contrasted with the joyful mass celebrated for the, for the Doge in San Rocco. Official pamphlets and unofficial writings, voices and shouts, news and leaks, music and noises, civic rituals and mystic signs interact within Chicogna's epistolary, allowing us to appreciate the interplay between different actors, audiences, and media which animated the explosion of communication triggered by the interdict crisis. Nevertheless, paying so much attention to so many and different sources of information requires a huge intellectual and interpretative effort. Being able to appreciate the complexity of a communicative system does not imply to control such complexity. Several times during the crisis, Cicogna admitted being overcome by the excess of information he was trying to consider and process, multi, multa, lucuntur. Such and similar expressions are recurrent in Cicogna's epistolary. Faced with the excess of information generated by the crisis, Cicogna admitted his anxiety and his skepticism about the possibility of getting any certain knowledge about the international situation. Too many voices were expressing too many opinions and too many signs were both confirming and denying each of these opinions. Nothing can be stated certainly, said Cicogna. I believe that even the princes themselves do not, do not know what is certain and what is not. End of quote. The risk of falling into fake news was clearly perceived by Strozzi Cicogna, but he did not know how to avoid it. The only solution he found was to report quite everything, leaving to his readers the ultimate choice about what to believe or not. Cicogna's letters perfectly makes the idea of what an explosion of communication was in terms of impact on audiences, helping us to question the stereographical problem of information production, reception, and re-elaboration in early modern era. Cicogna's epistolary allows us to appreciate both the consonance and discordance between the authorities' communicative aims, the aims of other information produ producers, and the actual impact of all these voices on society. In some sense, through such and similar sources, we can measure, on the one hand, the actual performative efficacy of the so-called official political communication, and on the other end, how subjects, people who were theoretically excluded from political information, approached, used, and reshaped political information in order to pursue personal and coll collective goals. Cicogna's interpretative choice and argumentative style are particularly useful for us as historians. Nevertheless, in the short term, such strategy showed a certain weakness. Cicogna understood the complexity of the moment he was living, but he failed in reducing such complexity and processing it into information immediately usable by the Civic Council of Vicenza in order to, to advise and orient its political action. He basically failed the task he was appointed to. Uh, 
we can better understand it if uh, we by, by comparing the the activity of Ciconia with the activity of his colleagues. Flaminio Buttiron was a Paduan lawyer who became resident ambassador of the city of Padua during the interdict crisis. He lived in the same neighborhood of uh, Ciconia, but unlike him, Butiron seemed less concerned with news about the interdict crisis. But this lack of interest is only apparent. Butiron chose to speak about the crisis only when he told that it could be useful for his city to do so. Just a few examples. On the 19th of April 1606, at the outbreak of the crisis, Butiron wrote to the Paduan Civic Council in order to urge it to petition the Doge and the Signoria, asking them to increase a series of local privileges. Butiron understood that the tension with Rome was urging the Republican government to be more compliant with its subjects in order to gain their consent and keep social cohesion. In such a moment, the city of Padua had to do everything possible to stand out among the other subject cities for loyalty and devotion. But on the 9th of May, 1606, something changed. The Republican government banished the Jesuits from all the Venetian territories, considering their decision to observe the interdict. Once again, Butiron understood what was happening and decided to immediately inform Padua's municipal authorities. An entire chapter had to be immediately canceled from the petition Padua had already submitted to the Doge. The chapter was that one in which the city of Padua asked the re reopening of the Jesuit schools Venice had closed at the end of the 16th century. During the interdict, the city of Padua revived a series of legal and political actions aiming to increase municipal control on the Paduan clergy. Butiron's contribution was crucial. Rather than report information about the crisis, he preferred to act as a broker between the crisis protagonists and the Paduan authorities. On several occasions, anti-ecclesiastical patricians, such as Niccolò Contarini, Antonio Querini, and even the Doge, Leonardo Donà, suggesting how and when to petition the Republic and which word should be used in doing it. Unfortunately, the entire epistolary of Carlo Prato, who was the resident, uh, resident ambassador of Verona, has been missed. Nevertheless, we can deduce something about uh, his approach to information from a petition he presented to the Serenissima Signoria. On the 27th of May, 1606, Carlo Prato asked for the removal of a series of floating mills which were in, the tur in a turn the Adige River does in the northern part of Verona. According to him, these floating mills could be used as ferry boats or Trojan horses by foreign armies coming from the imperial territories of Trento. The risk, he added, was further increased by the presence in the same area of the monastery of St. George, which was built alongside the walls of Verona. The friars, he said, cannot all be good subjects or good friends of the Mosseri Republic, end of quote. This statement perfectly followed one of the main arguments Venice was using in order to defend one of the anti-ecclesiastical laws the Pope was contesting, a law which demanded prior authorization by the Venetian Senate to build new churches and monasteries. In the official councils, it was explicitly stated that this law was adopted in order to grant security to the Venetian subjects, avoiding the construction of new ecclesiastical buildings alongside the defensive walls or in other unsuitable places. Carlo Prato borrowed this argument from the official communication of the Venetian government, reshaped it to his needs, and readdressed it to the Venetian government through a petition. The difference between Strozzi Cicogna, Carlo Prato, 
Ato or Flaminio Butiron is all in this. While Strozzi Ciccogna looked at the interdict as a matter of, of international politics, his colleagues looked at the interdict controversy as a source of information and arguments which could be practically used to pursue personal goals or the goals of their cities. If Strozzi Ciccogna watched the interdict crisis as a curious and anxious spectator, their colleagues understood that they could act in the crisis, even though as secondary charters. That was also the case of another ambassador of Verona, and I'm about to conclude, uh, Agostino del Bene. Sponsored by Paolo Sarpi, since the very beginning of the crisis, he started sending to the Venetian Senate legal advice about the interdict controversy. In May 1606, he successfully managed to be appointed to congratulate Leonardo Donat for his ducal election on behalf of the city of Verona. Del Bene seized this opportunity to show his loyalty and flaunt his legal knowledge. Once in front of the Doge, he delivered an apologetic oration in which he reshaped and refined a series of anti-ecclesiastical arguments borrowed from the government's official communications. The oration he offered to Leonardo Donat was crucial for his future recruitment as legal consultant of the Republic. Consultore in Jure, the same role which Paolo Sarpi had. Thank you. Thank you, Giovanni, for this uh, interesting paper, which adds new element also to the work of Filippo De Vivo and uh, adding a microhistorical uh, uh, new view to the, the interdict, also uh, highlighting the rule of, of, of different observations in a way. So the next speaker uh, is uh, uh, Luca uh, Marang Dr. Luca Marangolo. Uh, who is an uh, adjunct professor of comparative literature at the University of Naples. Uh, Luca received a PhD in comparative literature at the University of Roma Tre, has uh, extensively, uh, extensively um, written on uh, literature and other media, theory of narrative and narratology, he has been a research fellow at the University of California, Sorbonne Nouvelle uh, in the University of Italian uh, in Switzerland. And he's going to present actually a um, paper on titled Narrative Structures in Early Modern System of News, The Neapolitan Revolution of Mazzaniello and Other Cases. Please, Luca, uh, the podium is yours. Hi. Hi, David. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. A bit Hi, different. and see me too. You can yes. see me. Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Now I try to share my presentation with you. So we. Can you see it? Wait and hold a moment. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay, perfect. Okay, you can see it. So, I, good morning to you. Um, first of all, I would like to thank sincerely all the organizers of the event for giving me the opportunity to speak about my work. I'd like to present my, myself very briefly because I worked um, on a project at the University of Federico II at the, called the Tales of Two Cities, which was about early, mo uh, early modern news system. And unlike, but unlike mm, colleagues, my colleagues, and I think most of the speakers today, I'm not a pure historian, but rather an historian of literature. As I teach uh, literary criticism uh, at the University of Naples, as David said. So um, the question is why a literary cri critic would get so deeply interested in studying network of news? Uh, of course, it's a rhetorical question because there. Uh, there's a great deal of interest in this in studying the relationship between the, the two systems, of course, um, because early modern news was very influential uh, 
in all, in all fields of culture. Mm -hmm. Coming to my personal research interests, I was deeply involved in narratology and history of literary form. Um, so I was appointed to um, create an, inter an internet archive for the project. Uh, and I started to think about a project that they give me the opportunity to conceal both literary pro theory problems and communication theory problem, with also a potential of good potential of quantitative data analysis. Mm. My fo focus so was quickly turned to the problem of evolution of literary form, and the critical point was the following. Um, prominent scholars uh, reflected in the recent past about the evolution of literary forms in the ancient regime. They all tended to point out the fact that um, no, they point out that the fact that uh, mm, that there's, there's a great homogeneity of the literary system in the ancient regime. Uh, I have a quote from Guido Mazzoni, who, uh, who tells that in addition from differing from our theories, the expectation and categories with which the stories are designed and judged between the mid 16th and the mid 18th centuries are also related to each other and maintain an extraordinary continuity through the century. Extraordinary continuity. So I prepared here for you uh, uh, a little uh, bit of an explanation of, of the subject. If you see, if you check out the dates, you will see that we have uh, different theories among two centuries that basically are giving all of the same explanation of this extraordinary continuity. Of the, uh, of the narrative system. In Italia è pigliare il verosimile secondo quella forma che nella proposta materia conviene. So it means that you have to imitate uh, when, you, when you tell a story, imitate with a proper form convenient for the subject. And we see uh, almost the same argument in um, Monsieur Oué, la lettre traitée the Pierre Daniel Huet sur l'origine de Roman, which is 1661. And you see that uh, il faut toujours faire voir la vertu couronnée et le vice puni. And we have also 1742, so um, a century, basically. We have the same argument in Harry Fielding novel, jo Joseph Andrews. I mean, yeah. Um, the, uh, is, uh, is the, des the dress of poetry dot like the dress of man established character. So we have the, um, we have the problem of uh, uh, um, choosing a convenient form. That's, that's the problem. So there's a problem which is strictly, strictly related to the fact. Uh, the problem is this that there are a lot of great, a lot deal of great innovative forms in the history of literary forms of ancient regime. So we have this problem that, that we would like to understand how uh, this, we have reached this important innovation in literary form. But due to the fact that the system is very conservative as a whole, very conservative, conservative as a whole. The problem is that we cannot, cannot see exactly how the process worked. So this is a very frustrating problem because um, in the 19th century literature is very various, but in the ancient regime, this is great normativity. So um, how to understand this? Um, yeah evolutionary problem. Uh, my, I, my work hypothesis that maybe literary historians have looked for the evolution process maybe in the wrong field. Narrative, in fact, is not just a characteristic of literature, but rather something that involves both literature and other forms of expression of early modern society, like the system of news. 
Uh, so if you see uh, this slide, you can see that we have, um, for example, two very polar, polar, polarized forms such, such as romance and novel, which have very different uh, ways of performing. Uh, we have a long durée for the romance because yes, uh, we have uh, forms assimilated to the romance uh, up until the 18th century and a very, very narrow production for the novel, which is uh, which is almost so in the 18th century. We talk about novel, of course, the realist novel, um, which, which most specific definition of novel uh, um, created by Ian Watt. So we have we see the characteristic. And we have a polarized system, so we don't have a unified theory of the novel for this particular period. So, um, the, um, so I told about the characteristic. Uh, you see that you have uh, you have different uh, you have different subjects: the heroism, a public personality, nobleman, emotions, and the description of private self for the romance. And we have moralist for Maria's realist transparency of description, lower class characters, uh, and a really narrow production in space and time. So uh, the problem is that in order to understand basically uh, that there's a process that produces the evolution of literary form, also innovative literary form, such as, uh, for example, the picaresque novel of the Bildungsroman, we have to uh, swift our shift, our better, shift our theoretical background and don't think about a narrative of something that is related to a particular discursive system such as Rome moments or novel, but rather think about some a set of cognitive competences. Narrative is not something related specifically, specifically to the novel, uh, no more like uh, poetry or other literary genre, but most of all about uh, cognitive processes. And uh, here I uh, assign something, some um, basic elements of narrative as David Herman, David Herman English narratology um, describe them. You have situatedness, which is important because it, it's about the, about the system of media, um, basically, because um, narrative is always situated and it's different, uh, it's shaped differently uh, among the system, uh, across the system of media, of course. We have another category that I we'll use uh, afterwards, which is word making, word disruption. It means that narrative is never static, but challenge the acquired notion of the hearer. There's always uh, a movement and uh, it's not just a, a static description of reality, but it's, um, the world is changing and that's some, some kind of imbalance and a uh, sense of disequilibrium in narrative. Uh, the third category I will use is is what it's like. Narrative representation convey the experience of living through story walls and flukes. I like in the pressure of events, this is important, or real or imagined consciousness affected by occurrence, occurrences at issues. My thesis is that if you, if you, if we speak of narrative, thinking about this uh, set of cognitive, uh, of cognitive uh, abilities, we can uh, study better the evolution of narrative as a word, not of course just literary narrative, but of course uh, the whole total um, the system of narrative. So I compared I see, literature and uh, system of news. Uh, and uh, here you have uh, a slide about the transmediality, which is my work hypothesis that there's a common thread for the evolution and of, uh, of, uh, uh, of the system of ancient regime. We have the transformation of the public sphere. A sphere. We have Andreas Gestrick, which is uh, pioneeristic in using Luhmann's theory to describe describe the public sphere, the rise of printed information revolutionized the way society did communicated and information was accessible to anyone. When you have the definition 
definition of media in, trans in transition, transmediality, a phase during which the society, uh, cultural, economic, technological, legal, and political understanding media readjust in the face of disruptive change, which is basically uh, what was happening with the in invention of the press, basically. And of course, uh, something that we can synthesize with the medium is the message. Communication is, of course, not just the support, material support, but, but uh, cultural practice ritualized a collocation of different people on the same mental map sharing or engage uh, with popular ontology of representation, which is from Lisa Gittleman. And then you have a comparison between the, um, the narrative structures, the profound narrative structures of romance and a first example from the Napoleon Revolution. You have here, um, is Ottava, which is um, particularly casti, uh, which is uh, frettoloso, or da questo o quel canto confusamente l'arme si levava, non gli parve altra volta mai startante, um, che sul laccio scegliea dove si annodava, ma è troppo lungo ormai, signori, il canto, e forse anche ascoltar grava, sì che io differirò l'istoria mia in altro tempo che più grata sia. So, uh, what is um, it, how why i chose this this octava the problem is this you have here a particularly uh, accurate psychological description of the character which is rush he is um, a comical subject uh, it's a hero indeed but it's represented not as a hero but rather as a as a human being uh, not a nobleman not a representation of the of the allegorical symbol of the public sphere medi in medieval time, but rather um, someone who's um, psychologic, psychologically intent uh, with, with involved in the experience, should I say. So, and the second part of Yutava, uh, he says, I will postpone, I will postpone the story for a, for a better moment. It is a sign of the, the well-known technique called the entrelacement, which is the um, Vico Arioso was very famous of the entrelacement. So the theorist of, of romance such Guido Mazzoni or Terence Cave, they, they say they tell us that entrelacement is very important to understand the evolution of the of the romance because uh, um, it, it poses to the reader and to the writer a very problematic uh, cognitive exercise. If you, uh, the more they say, the more you postpone the story, so the more you break up the, uh, the unity of the story, the unity of the story in, Arist in the Aristotelian sense, uh, the more the, um, the reader and the writer are concentrated not so much uh, the, the, on the symbolic characteristics of the character, but rather to the action itself, of course, because they cannot identify, cannot identify the action into something symbolic, something that relates to the, to the, own, the own culture and the, the image of the heroes. So, uh, that's exactly what David Ehrman uh, uh, has defined as word making, word description. So the more the, uh, the, the description of the word is fragmented, is divided um, by the technique of the entrelacement, the more uh, romance has the possibility to describe not just heroes, but also human beings. And that's, the, and, and that's how the the system of literature evolves very, very slowly uh, through the romance. But um, my interest um, fell on the system of news about Napolitan revolution. Why? Why? Because in a very different way in respect to other, other um, system of news, for example, we see the system of news in Rome, which, which was very ritual, which was very static in the, in the description of events and very, uh, very harmonic, I would say. Um, the, the, 
the great event of the Napolitan Revolution um, describes uh, a more, a, a much more troubled and also disorganized system um, in narrative terms. So if you if you look, if you read the um, the passage which I uh, which has brought you, you have a very uh, a very problematic syntax, a not not very well organized text, I should say, and uh, also a, a tendency of create continuous continuous imbalances and continuous sense of disequilibrium, such of the, the, the information are. Uh, um, um, very much accumulated and then the, the event is explained on almost every time in a small part of the of the of the news account so what's the problem what's the problem here the problem is as i as i, as I pointed out that uh, the evolution of narrative in a uh, in a complex transmedial uh, system is to learn to, I would say with a formula, I could say to narrate the present, to narrate, so narrate something that is happening right now, and to organize narration in a system that could be, uh, as Liz Lisa Gittelman said, uh, shared as a uh, shared culturally, I would say. So you see, um, from the standpoint of uh, literary theory, um, this uh, document is, um, is very interesting because um, it avoids the, the <coughs> Stiltrennung system, so the, the division of styles, <coughs> you see, because we have not uh, something that hap that it's happening in the, uh, in the public sphere, as Abemas would put it, but rather in the system of um, something that exceeded, uh, at least until now, the public uh, like the event, the, like the revolutionary event, something that was never, never happened. So a narrator that has to narrate something that never happened has to grasp events, I would say, and um, learn how to. to program it. For example, you have the Lazzarillo de Tormes, the famous Picaris novel, which is, okay, I would move to the last example, which is, which is very realistic, but has not the ability to organize events. You have here uh, another, another example of the same problem, uh, which is uh, um, from the Jerusalem Meliberata, we have a different different psychological analysis of, uh, of the character uh, at the Conquistata, starting from the Liberata, and again, the same problem with other uh, examples of, of the revolution. Now, uh, last example, and I conclude, I would like to um, not to um, occup occupy much time, is uh, from 16, 64, and you have a very famous uh, passage from Old Flanders. You have the description of the of an attempt uh, of um, of a theft by by Moore, which is described as uh, young what the famous critics um, tells us um, with a very realistic fashion, very detailed, very complex and and, and crafted. But says uh, says Tifo, uh, there's still a very a great uh, moralistic uh, uh, look which is conveyed in the in the first person narration, which is of course not very realistic because um, Mott Flanders was a theft and a prostitute, of course, as uh, Defoe uh, points out. So if we if we confront this the, the way in, uh, the epidemic of 1764 was narrated, uh, you see that we don't have, of course, um, this problem of the um, of, of problem of moralism and uh, uh, the need 
to um, to uh, interpret it in um, in a in a symbolic, of course, event in, in a symbolic fashion. The events, of course, this could be could sound normal for us in a, in a contemporary era, but in fact was a conquer for uh, literature and for narration. Indeed, it was um, an accomplishment. So even even though it could be could seem normal. So um, what I want to stress out is the, the process, of course. There's a process in act which is a transmedial process, which uh, which involves an, an, the system of narration as a whole in literary uh, narration and of course uh, the system of news narration. I have concluded. Thank you, Luca, for this very bold uh, theoretical uh, framework you actually have added to our discussion. So next speaker uh, will be uh, Thomas Pritchard from University of Edinburgh uh, that's going to present a paper titled uh, An Autopsy in Ink, the Pan-European Ways to Find the Truth of the Six. 25 read upon Cadiz. Thomas Pritchard is a PhD candidate at the University of Edinburgh, researching the spectrum of the 30 years war in the culture of Iris Your Kingdom. Thomas completed an interdisciplinary master's in Center for Renaissance Studies at the University of York, and since starting PhD at the Edinburgh, has been visiting research at the University of Leiden and University, European University Institute. So uh, let's, uh, Thomas, the podium is yours. Wonderful, thank you. I'm going to keep my camera off because I have terrible broadband in North Yorkshire. So uh, to thank all the organizers, it's a fabulous conference. Thank you so much. And let's try and share this application. Fingers crossed, this will work. Can everyone see this? Uh, yes. Marvelous, excellent. So. The 1625 Anglo-Dutch raid upon the Spanish city of Cadiz is a contender for the most farcical expedition of the Thirty Years' War. Before proceeding to this news event, context is needed. Following the death of James I and VI of England and Scotland, and the accession of Charles I, the collapse of the Spanish match, the Caroline kingdoms chaotically veered into the continental crisis that would become the Thirty Years' War. Purportedly, for the cause of a lost Palatinate of Friedrich V and Charles I's sister, Elizabeth Stuart, the Winter Queen. In 1625, a Stuart expedition led by Count Ernst von Mansfeld wasted away in the Rhine Delta, unable to relieve a Dutch city of, of beleaguered Breda, which fell to the army of Flanders. Later that year, in the autumn of 1625, the Duke of Buckingham and Viscount Edward Cecil launched a fleet of 105 ships containing some 15,000 men to raid Spain's Atlantic coast, no doubt inspired by the recent Dutch success in Brazil, to attempt to seize a silver fleet returning from Spain's American empire as it, as it returned to Spain and to cut the sinews of Spanish finance. What ensued was a calamitous tragicomedy of errors. After being battered by the winter weather, the force Lord laid siege to a modern fortress, the Punto, at the mouth of Cadiz, wasting valuable time to capture this before proceeding over the arid land towards Cadiz. They were baffled to find not an undefended city, but a, a, a complex system of modern bastions surrounding Cadiz. Upon retreating to the coast, the commanders made a fatal mistake. They didn't bring fresh water with them, so they let their men raid a, raid a vineyard and gorge themselves in the wine cellar. In one of the first disastrous cases of Brits abroad, many of Cecil's forces were so drunken and dehydrated that when the Spanish sallied from Cadiz, the English retreat turned into a slaughter. The fleet then departed and, and uh, vitally missed the returning Spanish silver fleet before limping back to Plymouth with half of their men dead and half their ships lost. This presentation will examine a paper trail of Cadiz. As across Europe, the participants and spectators of a disastrous Caroline entry into the Thirty Years' War, officers and diplomats rushed to report and to understand the outcome of a raid, despite the impediments of bad weather conflicting rumours and rampant expectations in what is conducting a multilingual autopsy in ink. 
Unlike the siege of Breda and the later expedition to relieve the Huguenot stronghold of La Rochelle, which were full-scale media events in print across Europe, the Cadiz expedition leaves a much smaller print trail, in, but a vast manuscript circulation connecting the major nodes in trans-European news networks. So for example, Seville, uh, Madrid, Antwerp, and London. Fruit of the less likely notes created by the military circumstances of early Stuart logistics, Plymouth in the south of England, and Kinsale, a port which many of his conference uh, committee will surely be familiar with. In reconstructing this autopsy link, we need to consider the words of David Randall on credibility in Tudor and Stuart military news. The credibility and uncertainty are letter motives formed with the intersection between commerce, partiality, social credibility, and emotional involvement. Military news, states Randall, was an unstable in medium, uncertain in credibility, con contradictory in content, and was never read in blind faith. And to quote Joe Raymond, reading readership of early modern news would not sort of speculatively scan over a text, but they would ruthlessly mine it. The words of the news publication Mercurius Britannicus ring true. In 1625, when news of, of the Dutch success in Brazil was slowly traveling across the Atlantic, they wrote that news across the seas is a very unstable commodity. They will print verbatim what they hear once they translate it, but ultimately they urge the readership to use their judgment and that especially when there are tidings which contradict one another, don't attack the editor, but use their own judgment. In 1625, a London-based spy in the service of Spain wrote to the Chancellor, the Prince of Liege. Adicio Uvas wrote, it seemeth that this new King Charles I will cause certain mutations in his kingdom. He is army 93 ships for the war. The enterprise is yet to know him, but it is thought they are to oppose the King of Spain's great preparations. Although Cadiz had not formally been chosen as the final destination of this raid, its selection was almost culturally conditioned. Alongside the Spanish Armada's failure, the 1596 capture of Cadiz by an Anglo-Dutch fleet ranked amongst the triumphs of Elizabethan foreign policy. Cadiz was sacked and much of its fleet destroyed, and this event contributed to the 1596 bankruptcy of the Spanish monarchy. Furthermore, throughout the 1620s, intrigues across Europe discussed the possibility of a Stuart assault upon Spain. In the Archivo de Stato de Firenze, there is a really tantalizing document. The anonymous 1623 Sommario de il Capitolo della Liga fra il Re de Francia, Inglaterra, Repubblica de Venezia, e Duca de Savoia boldly proclaimed that a league had been drawn up for the restitution of a Bolsolina Valley and the Palatinate, which was in Spanish possessions, for a military and diplomatic offensive. As part of this plan, whilst Venezia attacks Puglia, it recommends the King of England was going to launch a, an armada of 100 boats to seize the Straits of Gibraltar, very close to Cadiz, and to destroy the Spanish fleet there, thus depriving Spain of a vital passage between the Atlantic and the Mediterranean. The scenario may have jumped the gun somewhat, but it nevertheless echoes the plan of Viscount Edward Conway the Secretary of State, James I, to plan a European League to halt the rampant descendancy of Spain in the early stages of the Thirty Years' War. As a young man, Conway was at the sack of Cadiz. As we can see, Cadiz was a cultural obsession, emblazoned, as we can see here, upon a frontispiece of William Camden's Annals of the Reign of, of Famous Queen Elizabeth. We see Cadiz being blazed here. By an Anglo Dutch fleet, and it's little coincidence that one of the architects of Caroline foreign policy, the Duke of Buckingham, paid Peter Paul Rubens handsomely to paint an equestrian portrait. Here, the Duke rears as Neptune watches on in awe as a, as a Duke launches a fleet to destinations yet unknown but very guessable. In the summer of 1625, Sir John Coke even based an estimate for the cost of an imminent expedition of 10,000 men upon the very same costs of a 1596 expedition. However, if the English wished to repeat the past, the Spanish had learned from it. That very summer, Conway was sent a report of news that the Spanish were fortifying Cadiz in anticipation of an attack. But 
And this was also cooperated if we look to Alvise Gonzalini, the Venetian ambassador at The Hague, who wrote upon attending a meeting uh, between English and Dutch ambassadors that they were planning an attack on Cadiz. But he said this is strange because although it's a strategic passage of gold, it's now very well defended. Evidently, Conway disregarded this news, or his warning was ignored by Bagiant Cecil, the Earl of Wimbledon, who arrived in the Bay of Cadiz in early November. What happened next prompted a dispersion of news, both forensically accurate and wildly anticipative. So by the 7th of November, Viscount Wimbledon's force had admitted defeat at Cadiz and was limping back um, after to try and capture the Spanish silver fleet. We can see from the letters of Lunardo Moro, the Venetian ambassador to Spain, that on the 9th of November, news had reached Madrid that 80 galleons had arrived and laid siege to the fort, uh, fort of Pontal near Cadiz. They had slaughtered the garrison of 40 men, sparing only two, who were to bring the news to Cadiz and to the rest of Spain that England were here, not as enemies of Spain, but to fight for the restitution of the Palatinate. The Spanish conclusion alludes to what Brendan Dooley has marvelously um, coined contemporaneity, that at this present in Madrid, everybody here believes that due to the strength of Cadiz, the English will not succeed. So on screen, we see two anachronisms. One is a map of 1702, another is a map of modern nation states, of course, which didn't really exist in a form back then. So in 1702, we can see a much earlier plan the city of Cadiz is here, the straits open down there, and to the right of the image, we see the fort of Puntal that Viscount Wimbledon wasted time besieging. When we look to English officers writing from the Bay of Cadiz in the wake of a disaster, we have to navigate with the differences between the Julian and Gregorian calendars. We can see that the first mention of calamity came from Sir William Ledger, sending ahead a letter to the Duke of Buckingham dated on the 8th of, of November. According to Ledger, the, um, great, the fair brought a great dishonor to the army. The force, the lacked abilities and provision had been unmanageable and under the influence of wine. Ledger did not know if he wished to survive the, hope, the hope return journey from Cadiz to Plymouth. Four days later, Morrow writes with confirmation that that very evening, a courier came from Cadiz bringing the news that a sally from the elderly Don Fernando Giron had defeated the English and repulsed them, despite being in conditions of heavy rain and, and being marvelously outnumbered. The Spanish had, had put to the sword 400 English and drowned the rest in the surf, taking many prisoners. Nevertheless, anxiety remained over the imminent arrival of a silver fleet that was at the mercy of English ships who departed and rumoured to be in league with the Corsairs of Algeria. When we move our lens northwards away from the Iberian Peninsula, the excitement and confusion of news metamorphoses significantly as it's halted by the winter storms. On the 28th of November, the painter and diplomat Peter Paul Rubens, whose huge diplomatic connections makes his vast correspondence invaluable, he wrote that news had just arrived from France but the English fleet had seized land at Cadiz. Now, Rubens is cautious. Many in Antwerp, he notes, claim that the English have stormed Cadiz, and that, ironically, for the cause of reformed religion, Buckingham is now in league with the Corsairs of Algeria. But either way, he suspends judgment and says that, either way, all of Spain is now in arms. By early December, news of the first, news of the first um, tidings reached England, actually celebrating a triumph. At Dover Castle, we can look to the state papers to see John Hippesley receiving news from Flanders that Cadiz had been taken and that Spanish reinforcements had been massacred. The Silver Fleet was expected to arrive extraordinarily soon and the triumph could be completed. It would, it would seem that the capture of the Fort of Pontal and not Cadiz may might have prompted these rumours. It's only by the second week of December the confirmation of a, of a defeat arrived in Antwerp. Rubens relates that express arrived from the King of Spain, uh, saying that the English had been repulsed by a brave sally from the Don Fernando Giron, for the English had, had retreated in great disorder with the loss of maybe 600 men. With this rampant uncertainty unfolding, as torrid weather scattered um, and slowed the returning English fleet, 
we can see from the state papers that the Council of War in Plymouth desperately looked for sources, not only from returning officers, but from Spanish sources too. We can see translated the realities of the expedition. One letter that may well be a scribal copy of the same manuscript Peter Paul Rubens just looked at, well, a long time ago, was dedicated to the King, Infanta and Archduchess. It praised God's providence for the English had wasted their time attacking the fort of Puntal that gave valuable warning to Cadiz to save the rest of the fleet and also to bring reinforcements. The English then proceeded to burn what they could of the hinterland and vitally they did much spoil and spilling of wine. Although the return of officers confer to Plymouth confirmed the worst of the news, the fleet's commander could, uh, could not. Viscount Wimbledon and many of his ships had got to the Isles of Scilly, just off Cornwall, where they encountered a huge storm. They couldn't go to Plymouth, so they went to Kinsale, just south of Cork. Some say that the ships, some ships had 10 foot of water in their hold, although that's an interesting claim. So at Kinsale, we see yet another vital element of news relation, in-person testimonies dependent on social relations. Set from Kinsale, Cecil was evidently very depressed and he wrote to the Duke in early 1626 that he fears what was being said of him in Plymouth by lesser men in the fleet who envied his position. He wished to, for the Duke's friendship and company to see him in person, to end the misery of his name being surely being besmeared and misled by his own men. The War Council, he says, had advised him to abandon Cadiz, and so he did. But he had he had fought on his guts. If he stayed at Puntal with a garrison, he might be able to stay and capture the Silver Fleet, therefore mitigating for this disaster. But no, he listened to his own men. This account of news, although inevitably tinged with a fascinating bitterness, may not be wildly inaccurate either as we can see from a letter of the Count of Olivares, that in a providential reading of the news, miraculously, the silver fleet missed the English fleet by a mere day. Cecil does notice that the malice and envy of the world is fixed upon him right now. Nevertheless, 1626 produced fantastical rumours. In exile in The Hague, Elizabeth Stuart, the Winter Queen, wrote that news arrived confirming that Cadiz had been too strong for Cecil's force but they had only lost 50 men of the expedition and they had captured a huge amount of Spanish ships, ships possibly from the silver fleet. We can see Kinsale's, in Kinsale, news traveling between Waterford and the deputy of Ireland writing that he just heard from a captured ship from Lisbon who had docked in Waterford, the, the, um, the crew being interrogated, but yes, the silver fleet was arrived safe and sound, but about three days in time difference. As returning officers in Plymouth were writing reports of a calamity, a small number of printed narratives were now being authorised. It would seem that it would seem that from a tiny print trail that we have surviving, the, a level of state control was being asserted. Indeed, this hypothesis is supported by the Venetian ambassador in London, Zuani Pesaro, who stated to some extent that some say the English losses were so much greater than have been um, reported and edited in the news. They're hiding in his publications this disaster at Punto. What is available, available to us today is indeed sparse. And one printed text that was printed in April 1626 purportedly brought a heroic piece of good news. I think we have lost connection. Escaped, killing his captors, fleeing back to England. Um, after what was a cowardly ambush. The narrative concerns not the catastrophic events of Cadiz, but focuses on the cruelty of the Spanish and a providential escape of a soldier who stands like a polemical allegory of the expedition as a whole, who escapes imprisonment like the Israelites crossing the Red Sea. The official narrative of Viscount Wimbledon was published in both London and Amsterdam in 1626 when he finally returned from Kinsale. There is a dramatic understatement in Viscount Wimbledon's printed rendition for wider consumption. The drunkenness of his soldiers is downplayed. Cecil writes that he simply wanted to refresh his men after a, after a hard fight at the Puntal, a march upon Cadiz, 
So he let, he, he took the advice of his officers to open up a wine cellar. But little did I think that the country was so full of wine. I mean, what did it expect in, in the Sherry Triangle? Who knows? Ultimately, in this attempt to shape perceptions of what has been a baffling and disappointing news, Cecil concedes that God's providence had ultimately decided that his scavenging fleet had missed the Spanish silver fleet very narrowly, and that blame should be put upon his junior officers, and ultimately we should give in to the will of God. So to conclude, scratching beneath the surface of Cecil's printed narratives, we can see a vast multilingual transconfessional network of correspondence in manuscript form, from letters between friends and acquaintances to lengthy manuscript news reports from a Spanish court to the attempt of junior officers to defend their, their conduct in conducting a rearguard um, retreat to their ships. We can even see from Cecil's scattered fleet writing from Kinsale in Ireland to men and women in religious orders in the Spanish Netherlands, that eagerly consuming news that might have a bearing upon the persecution of Catholics in England. So we can see an endeavor to conduct an autopsy in ink. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Thomas, for this uh, very interesting paper, which remind us all about the interconnectedness of the European news network, which uh, in a way was really material one. So I will, ju I will just open the floor for questions if there are, and let me see. Otherwise, I would like just to point out there is a, it seems to me there is a fil rouge in all the, 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 the papers, which is, that could be actually uh, seen in this way. What is an event in a, uh, in a certain sense? How the event, in a way, the interdict or the siege in Seville, or also, you know, uh, the, the Neapolitan Revolution uh, can actually transform the uh, media ecology. And I think this is a, an interesting point uh, to, to ask, but I'm sure that uh, will be other questions. Um, or if you wanna, if you wanna answer on on the question that I actually uh, was thinking about, what is all of our speaker can actually uh, answer if they want. What is an event in terms when we think about uh, communication? If you don't mind me jumping in first. Sorry? If you don't mind me jumping in first for that yeah. excellent question. Yeah. I would say event is quite, can be quite an anachronistic, a very retrospective judgment. Often it's a series of multiple events. In the case of the siege of Cadiz, it's a multiple set of calamities with a sort of causality moving forward. It's like, an, it's like a series of events unfolding, but of course is later crystallized once sort of rumor has become concretized, once we once the contemporaries knew what, knew what happened into a wider event. That said, when we look before in, in hindsight and retrospect to the planning stages in The Hague, for example, there is an envisioned event. But of course, I think it's that sort of desperate optimism that views this, oh, we're gonna have an event, we're gonna repeat history as sort of part of the naivety of the early Caroline state and one of the calamities. Thank you. I have a question for Giovanni um, about the different attitude of the resident ambassador. Mm -hmm. Yes. What can it explain <clears throat> this different attitude? The instruction instruction gave by the cities or uh, the formation of this man? Uh, unfortunately, uh, a lot of uh, these letters. Uh, have been missed. We missed in particular the instruction given by the, uh, the subject cities to their ambassadors in the case of Vicenza, for example. In the case of Verona, we missed all the epistolary. We have only the petition I have presented. And, um, but I think that uh, your question is very, is, is a really good question because in the case of um, Strozzi Cicogna, we could understand that he was uh, asked to do so by explicitly by his subject city. city. Uh, 
by Vicenza, by the municipal government of, uh, of Vicenza. And uh, in the case of Flaminio Butiron, which was the who was the, the ambassador, the resident ambassador of Padua, uh, he wasn't asked to do so. Uh, so, um, of course, it's a matter of instructions given to the ambassadors, but it, in my opinion, is also a matter of uh, of um, inclination, of personal inclination. And in the case of of uh, Strozzi Cicogna, is particularly evident because. He also considered uh, mystical signs as sources of information, and it's something that is really related with his uh, activity as a demonologist and theologian. Well, um, just to follow up, there is a question from Andrea Di Carlo that maybe is on the same line. Andrea, if you want to... Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Giovanni, hi. Thank you for your very... Uh, interesting paper. Uh, have a, have a follow-up on witchcraft. Uh, did Chikonia write anything more specific about witchcraft? About which? About witchcraft? Uh, yeah. Uh, no, he, the uh, the book, the Palagio degli Incanti, the mm -hmm. masterpiece of Strozzi Chikonia, is about uh, demons, not about witch. So he wasn't particularly interested in witchcraft. Okay, so that was just about the uh, demonology. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I see. Maybe Brandon Dooley, Professor Dooley. Yeah, I had a, I had a question. Um, this really, in a way, regards um, all three papers, which I want to thank you for fascinating material, and I think we're getting into some uh, important methodological um, aspects that really concern not only early modern but also um, modern studies, but my question had to do with the uh, the connection between uh, context and content in this sense. So I find it fascinating in uh, Luca's paper where we're dealing with a uh, a notion of of uh, romance and how the um, this genre of romance is uh, affects the uh, actual um, narrative structure of news reporting. And it, listening to um, Thomas's talk and also to some degree to um, Giovanni's, uh, I'm, uh, it made me think of um, if we're considering the relation between romance and narrative, what about the connection between romance and experience? So. In other words, is it possibly the case that events themselves are in some ways shaped by um, romance? And how would we find that out? Uh, Luca, you it's, want to it's a question for me or for Giovanni? For me. Uh, I totally agree with uh, what uh, Brendan Dooley said. Um, I think that romance is a form that basically shaped the imaginary also with, uh, of the completer of news. And also it shaped the uh, competence, competences about narrating things. So um, the answer is, of course, yes, there's a great um, deal of shaping the imagery and the way um, uh, um, um, communicators in general, I should say, not just writers, looked at the, at the public sphere about Rome, a sphere about Romans. But the, the problem, how do we, uh, we understand it? I, I should just say that we understand it very little, very little bit, because uh, of the great deal of distance of the Romans, of the Romans form for Mm, we have a great deal of distance from the imagery of Romans, but in, in any way, mm, maybe th that's the problem. Maybe that's the key problem. We know uh, very little about the evolution of literary forms in ancient regime era because we, very, we know very little about what happened before the creation of the public sphere in a, in a, um, um, Habermas sense, and we have a very, a very stereo, stereo, 
stereotype, this image, I would say, of the public, of the medieval public sphere. That's basically, we know very little about it. So <laughs> I don't have an answer. That's a good answer. Okay. <laughs> Even though, I mean, in your methodological reference seems to me more a Lumanian attack to Habermas, Habermas. Uh, absolutely, I'm, uh, I'm uh, such a Lumen fan. <laughs> I knew it, Dali. Uh, uh, there is a question from uh, Giovanni, uh, which is actually in the chat. So if you want to answer the bit longer, I can actually repeat it. So, uh, uh, oh, okay, okay. I'm, I'm, yes. reading, I'm reading it. Thank you. Oh, uh, yes, 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 yes. Um, <clears throat> of course, uh, Watson looks at the Venetian civic ritual with the Protestant eyes. Uh, so, in, in, but, but what is important to me to stress in this letter written by Watton is that he understands that Venet the Venetian government was reshaping such rituals in order to use it as a shield, as a communicative weapon or a communicative shield to, to answer the, the, the offensive launched by, the communicative offensive launched by the, by the Pope. So um, for me, that's what is important to stress in this letter. The fact that uh, uh, Watton was uh, aware that also rituals could be used as, a, as, a, as a sources of information and sources of communication. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if Tom want to answer to the question of uh, Professor Dooley. By the way, just to follow up what uh, Giovanni was saying, I mean, it's crucial in really modern, uh, you know, Europe's understanding the rule of uh, cities. I was thinking about Marino Beringo, a work on cities and how cities, especially particular cities such as Venice or Capital, but even uh, also other mm -hmm. small ones. Uh, the, how we can actually understand the history of city through a communicative lens. And I think that your work is aiming at doing something like, uh, like this. And also, you know, on a micro historical level, just to understand the, the, the deeds and actions of all the people who were involved in this event or process. So Tom, you wanna answer the, the, the questions or? Uh, yes, go for it. Yeah, fantastic question. I think romance works on two levels here. We have self-fashioning, which is very evident in the Anglo-Dutch forces. We have sort of a wish to emulate 1596 again, but also it's for the cause of Elizabeth Stuart. It's going back to a rich older chivalric tradition that we see sort of like a dispossessed queen, a dispossessed damsel in need of help. It's a very sort of old tradition and we we have, um, for example, uh, Christian Mad Halberstadt was obsessed with this idea of chivalry. But going back as well, we have events of shocking brutality. When the Puntal falls, the garrison are massacred, apart from two men. And they're very nicely told, we're not here as your enemies, we're here for Elizabeth Stewart, basically. It's almost like a jazz hands moment. It's a really bloody moment. But I think moving forward as well, when we have an attempt to consolidate news and information and to sort of steer public opinion in print to a much wider audience but also the idea to, that the romance is a good genre to help out with this case of this swashbuckling man from Devon for example who fights his way out of a Spanish ca captivity he survives nonetheless he's like an allegory of a fleet we have a very sort of he's um, an allegory in miniature basically of a disaster that's really sort of airbrushing out the horrible sort of defeat and make it into like a, a personal hero like a, a returning knight who's coming home so hope i answered the question excellent thank you, thank you very much i'd say um shall we um yes uh wrap up the morning so Thank you, uh, all speakers and uh, listeners. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. So well. And so we'll convene again at uh, 1.30 for our keynote lecture of uh, Professor Chapman, who will be talking about challenges beyond the news, the rediscovery of neglected 
forces. Uh, that's at 1.30 uh, uh, GMT time. 